Hello everybody, Mike with Spray Jones coming to you with another video. In this video, we're going to discuss today's topic of smooth versus rough spray foam. And this is probably a long overdue uh, video topic because it gets the most amount of conversation when people have received open and closed cell foam. So first, let me disclaim something here. Uh, open cell foam is not meant to be looking smooth and pretty. You can get it pretty doggone smooth. There are some guys and some products and some chemistry out there and techniques that can get it half decently smooth. But due to the fact that it has a water blown uh, product, it is designed to expand rapidly and you're not to be getting it smooth. So it's going to have a very pillowy cloud uh, formation of foam. In most cases, if it is going into a stud cavity uh, that's not very deep, it's going to be shaved off flush. So this isn't a, an aesthetic issue with open cell foam. Um, this is going to be a closed cell foam topic. So closed cell foam is usually going to maintain its skin and its face, you know, inside of a wall cavity or in a roof or what have you. And generally people are paying for what I, we would call is a nominal thickness. Now let, let me describe that. Nominal is meaning plus or minus a certain value. So usually in the industry, a uh, quarter of an inch is what we try to set things to, either a quarter of an inch low or a quarter of an inch high. So in layman's terms, if you want a two inch application, your spray foam closed cell should be anywhere from one and three quarter inch to two and one quarter inch varying. I would say if you had the whole entire job that barely ever got up to uh, one and three quarter inch, you'd probably be a little on the low side, right? However, that's what we try to, to deem. Unless you decide otherwise, if you and the customer or the client or whoever decide that you want to go a little bit thicker, uh, there's been many times where I know that I've got somebody that's requesting a uh, four inch application, so I'll just spec it out at four and a half. I'll put the pricing in for four and a half, the time and material for four and a half, and tell the guys, look, probe all your low spots and make sure they're at four inch, for example, right? So you can decide what you want to do, but uh, certain jobs you might want nothing under the specification if the architect the engineer or you in the building order to decide that but then there's lots of situations where you can't be uh thick if you're doing a masonry cavity wall on the outside of a building and the, and the too thick of foam is going to interfere with where the brick has got to go it's going to interfere with the siding the zed girts you know on and on and on or just plain old-fashioned drywall you got a two by four wall i try to talk people out of getting three inches into a three and a half inch cavity why excess amount of shaving and it's not going to be guaranteed to be uh, smooth everywhere and we're going to have to put a lot more time in so uh thick can interfere as well so realistically folks this is the meat and potatoes here now what determines whether or not things are going to be smooth or not well the number one thing is the substrate that you're spraying to now believe it or not a really well sprayed job you should be able to see what the substrate looked like through to the top of the of the closed cell foam right and I had a guy one time, we sprayed a foam, he said, you need to come back here. I mean, there's only got to be an inch, half an inch of foam on this job. And I said, no, it's it's two inch. The guys that actually sprayed it that smooth, that it picked up the profile of the seams in the concrete and just telegraphed that through. So remember, the, the closed cell foam under ideal conditions is expanding 25 times the liquid mass of what you put on. So any bumps and irregularities uh, are going to be magnified to the surface on that, right? So foam will take the profile of what is underneath it. That's the first thing. The second thing is pattern on the gun. So this is a huge, huge subject uh, because if you have it fine tuned, if you have a properly atomized pattern, and what I mean by atomized is that it's, it's putting a fine distributed amount of foam in a either fan or circular pattern that doesn't have any big jet streams it's not heavy to one side and light on another that's the first thing that you need to have in order to spray uh, good quality smooth looking closed cell foam you've got to have a very good pattern and pattern is going to be influenced at the gun by the pressure that you're spraying at so you can get a much better pattern at eight or nine hundred psi than you can at eighteen hundred psi right so you can get too big of a plume, too much velocity, too much spray coming out. Otherwise, sometimes you got to turn it downwards, right? A lot of times we're going to spray at 1,000 to 1,200 PSI. So you need to have good pressure. You need to have very good temperature because if you cannot have warm product, then you can't atomize it because it's too thick, it's too globby, it's too lumpy, it's too bumpy. It's going to come out of the gun that way. The next is chemistry, right? So you, you need to have a good working foam. Not all foams are made equal. 
not all closed cell foam spray equal. We get people asking questions all the time. How do you guys spray the foam so smooth? Well, you start off with a really good product that has really good chemistry. It has good surfactants. It has good um, catalyst in it. And it's just got a really good effective blend. And it's going to want to lay down smooth, right? Certain foams just don't. You can dial around with the settings on the machine. You can dial your pressures up and down. You can clean the gun six times in a day, and it still wants to be snotty on you, right? Then the big subject is gun cleanliness. So if you are having clogging, if you've got clogging in the screens, you got buildup on the front of your gun, uh, you're going to be fighting a pattern all day long. And it's going to be really hard to be putting on even a consistent foam because it's heavy to one side all of the time, right? The first thing was told to me uh, almost 20 years ago when I started spraying foam professionally, when I left the distribution market, is that a good sprayer is continually adjusting their technique for how their gun is spraying, right? Now, obviously, there's some things, as we all know, as sprayers, that it's just frustrating. You're like, okay, enough. I got to stop. I got to rebuild this gun. Something's not right. But uh, a good sprayer is not throwing a fit every five minutes just because it's a little bit heavier to one side. You're going to have to hold the gun a different way or change your technique or just change your timing, okay? Number three is uh, positioning. So if you're going to be spraying overhead, if you're going to be really close to the substrate, so overhead, obviously, it's going to be hard to maintain. Why? Because you've got overspray coming down onto you, onto the gun, onto everything. So overhead is an issue as well as close. Like if you're in a crawl space, you're spraying vertically up or in tight positions, and you can't move, you can't move your arm, you can't get the gun, you've only got two inches of stroke or something like that to move around, yeah, it's going to be really difficult. And that, and that's also going to be in relation to the rise of the foam. How is the foam rising? If you're into a backed into a corner and the foam is rising quick, you're going to have to go slow. You're not going to have a chance of making things look super, super smooth, right? Number four, ambient temperature and conditions at the substrate. So too hot is a real problem with foam. In fact, when uh, I first started out very frustrated in the summer months you know you'd have a pattern for a few hours in the morning and then it was gone and talked ended up talking to a veteran at the time of 20 plus years at that time when i was spraying and he said oh it's just too hot it's just you got to cool things down and that is very true sitting in the sun hose sitting in the sun job site sitting in the sun inside your trailer but primarily it's what's going on from when you leave the trailer to the substrate itself so a lot of times turn the heat off like in the summertime when it's really warm we're turning primaries off we're turning a hose off or we're running a combination of one or two of them off right very rare is it all off we had hose sitting out in the sunlight one time could not get a good pattern way too hot sitting there in the sun so as soon as we got it into the shade you know we weren't picking up all this extra temperature that was throwing the pattern off why does it throw the pattern off because it excites the blowing agent and and it's like more of a radical explosion at the gun versus a controlled explosion the temperature that's in the uh in your chemical is the only the one that you want to make it right you don't want to pick up extra temperature that you uh can't control so ambient temperature on site too cold is a real problem you're going to be fighting it jet streaming the pattern is going to be narrow thin it's going to be heavy uh, it's just not going to want to spray very well. You're going to be fighting this tiny little Dixie cup uh, of a pattern, and it's not going to lay out smooth for you. Your customer is going to be upset. Too hot's a big problem. Got a plume, continually fingering, building up on the front of the gun. Humid is a problem. Get into a rainy day, a high humidity. The gun will actually build a little bit of a finger on the end of it because uh, it's starting to, the, the isocyanates are reacting with the moisture. It's starting to polymerize and kick over on the front of the gun. And then excess wind. I don't know how anybody is able to spray a clean and neat job when the wind is constantly blowing the pattern on the gun. Never mind the fact that you're carrying overspray down and getting it onto cars. So, and then the, the obvious thing is water and obstructions. I had um, I had this guy that did a substrate. He put a bunch of things in our way. There was boxes in our way. There was framing in our way. There was things in our way. And then he had the gall to start complaining about the job isn't looking very neat. Well. Yes, we can move those things, but a lot of times those things need to be moved out of the way. And if they can't be moved out of the way, then the old spring saying of you get what you get and you don't get upset applies. Water is an issue too, folks. Uh, you're like, well, shouldn't you not be spraying with water? Absolutely, you shouldn't. You know, it's not going to stick. But I have seen situations where there is just a tiny little bit of water on the substrate or the, or um, just in the air in general, it's just it just rained. It rained two hours before you set up to go spray foam. Now it's just very high humidity, and the water in the actual air is just going to make life difficult with the pattern on the gun and how things are performing. And the fifth and final point on that on the 
obvious things is installer proficiency and ability. So this is hand-eye coordination. Uh, if you've just started spraying, you're going to need to watch because everywhere you dwell, everywhere that you pause is where the foam is going to build up and become lumpy and bumpy. And with the delayed reaction of triggering on and off and, and holding your hand and where you're positioning yourself, that's going to determine whether you got thin spots or thick spots. So having a great pattern and a good substrate and all your temperatures dialed in, it then is on the diligence of the person with hand-eye coordination if they can control and make an even uh, movement from top to bottom, bottom to top, left to right, whatever direction that you're going, uh, then you can actually watch the wave of the foam rising and you know, all right, I'm in the zone. Don't go any faster, don't go any slower. You know, it's just like laying out hot glue out of a hot glue gun, right? Anywhere that you go too fast, too thin, you're going to have thin spots or thick spots, right? Same thing with welding. You know, you can't stay in one place for very long. So the top five things are that. And then we'll get into now sort of what can rough versus smooth mean. Rough can work. Uh, it, it doesn't need to be replaced. Just because we've got rough or uneven foam does not mean that we... Uh, have to scrap the job. So if you're going to be doing top coatings, obviously a rough substrate is going to soak up a lot more material or in some situations, if it's rough enough, it, it can prevent you from even being able to get effective amounts of coating into all the little nooks and crannies and valleys that you've created. If you're into tight spaces and you are pushing the foam on extreme angles because you, you don't have the room to move and you're trying to get the foam to almost slide into place, you can actually get what I call rhino hiding where you've rolled the foam over and it and it represents or or looks like the elephant hide or a rhino's hide it's extremely undulating and up and down and then you won't know if some of those fissures and cracks that you may or may not be able to see go all the way down to a substrate or halfway through the foam or what and those are areas where you you could end up being compromised this is common when people get into trying to spray into attics or tight spots where they just do not have the overall uh room to articulate and to get the spray gun 90 degrees perpendicular to the substrate uh, but you as the end consumer the builder the homeowner the end recipient uh, you need to be evaluating whether or not your money's being wasted I mean if I hired somebody to put on a two-inch application and I'm everywhere majority of my spots are all the way down to an inch and then I've got spots that are all the way up to three inches, then I'm going to be having a discussion with the installer saying, look, I really don't have my money's worth here. I mean, you've put on way, way too much in certain areas. I can appreciate that, that you've, you've outlaid, cost outlaid for way too much material. But in the areas that matter, I'm, I'm significantly low. Uh, and this begs the question is, okay, what really should be reasonable for touch-ups and stuff like that. And uh, what we try to do is if we are consistently finding areas when we do a visual with the homeowner or the building owner or whatever, if we visually start to see a lot of areas that are outside of the quarter inch low, then obviously we've got a number of areas that need need touching up. So what we try to do is we try to set our probes uh, a quarter of an inch higher than what we're targeting. So a two inch job, we set the probes to two and a quarter. We know that if we're just going to be kissing up to the probe, then we're good to go. Uh, so then we'll go and put the foam on, the foam's dialed in, the guys have a good pattern, they got the good settings, everything's, everything's flowing right. And at that point, they're just, they're in the zone to know when they're looking at a two or a two and a quarter or two and a half inch application. So they begin to probe and a good installer will probe frequently, but they don't need to be probing frequently. And what that means is they get a, a really good feel of just how much material they've been putting on and the probe is more or less used to recalibrate their eyes to what their hand-eye coordination is doing so you're like okay this area here is definitely low this area here is definitely high you know i need to dial it back my, my guys are fairly good but you know we're human beings we're not infallible yeah. and uh you should be probing and you should be probing often enough that you can get an average of what you're doing and figure out whether you need to be uh, topping it up or it, consistently if you're if you're too high I mean putting on too much foam your boss is charging for two inches and they've priced it for two and you're gonna be putting on two and a half to two and three quarter you know you're putting all that on for free your boss doesn't have the money built in to do that so you really want to be dialed in I tell my guys listen let's let's be really really accurate with our amount that we're putting on here uh, again the the surface popcorn finishes uh, they can really 
uh, hold you back on top coatings, but they really aren't going to hold you back on anything on performance. Like some of the more uglier pig guts uh, that does not look good underneath it performs fine. If it's well adhered uh, and it's actually the thickness or slightly thicker than what you need, a ugly looking surface level of spray foam will be just fine. Okay. Now, if that is going to be the inside of your shop and then that's what you're going to be looking at on the ceiling or on the walls, yeah, you could end up being pretty ticked. I mean, this is very common with uh, Quonsets and metal buildings where they're not putting a covering on them. You really want to get them dialed in and try, as you may, to put on a good looking um, product. But again, I've told people before, I try to set the expectations with my clients that this is never going to be board stock. Um, good days, bad days, especially in the humid summer days, it can be difficult to maintain a consistent, clean and neat pattern. And anybody spraying foam knows what we're talking about. You can get on one side of the building that's in the shade and it's dialed in and spraying beautiful and you lay it on smooth. And then as you come around into the sun where the substrate's hot, and the day starts to warm up, uh, it can it can be really difficult. An ultra hot pattern will spray consistently more difficult than a cooler pattern will. You can lay on fairly smooth, even even glossy looking spray foam that's on the cold side, uh, and that can cost them in density and just time and material that it takes to put on the slower application. But when you get a overly plumed pattern that makes for popcorny or rough or just the foam is being belligerent i call it like it just it just doesn't want to lay down smooth the pattern on the gun is being an issue yeah it's 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 going to cost you and not look as good so that is always a temperature issue but to the end consumer um the good news is that if you stayed this long in the video that uh it does not really really matter too too much if it's rough it will effectively work. You can pull out a thermal camera and start looking at things with a camera and see just how things are performing if you've got any questions about that. But to get things dialed in, it's going to take those five things that I talked about earlier um, and then the diligence of your installers. So I hope this helps. I hope this brings some clarity to the industry if you're on the tools in spray and foam or whether you're looking to hire a guy and preparing yourself mentally for what you're going to get. Uh, share this with somebody, lay out a comment, like and subscribe, and we'll catch you on future videos.